That's nice. Yeah, it's good. Thanks, Juarez, for sitting with me here. I can't believe we had to bring out our own chairs. <laughs> I know. What kind of That's how you know it's this? not the Tonight Show. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's DIY. You gotta like bring your own chair out here. Well, thanks for sitting with me here. Um, we're gonna be in conversation a bit. There's many things to discuss. Uh, I was thinking maybe I'd start in the reverse just because maybe we'd start with what I just found out just now from you about this day that's coming up. I hear, maybe you can tell me, what did you find out recently? Do we have to start in the reverse? <laughs> you want to you wanna make that the surprise at the end? All right, fine, we can wait. So you moved to Brooklyn at age five. You're basically a New Yorker. More New Yorker than most New Yorkers, I would say. And in this particular metropolitan moment where everyone's been there for five years and complains about the gentrification of New York. Um, tell me about living in New York. What was that like? I know you moved to Poughkeepsie or something for high school. Is that right? And then for, came back? For college. For college. For college. Okay. So what was your New York experience like growing up? Growing up in New York, I mean, it was, was pretty quiet. I, I grew up in Brooklyn, went to high school in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tech, and um, oh, right. Brooklyn. Anyone? <laughs> they you. don't have a football team, do they? They do. They do. Okay. I, I wasn't on the football team, um, but it was, it was a very simple, quiet existence, and uh, I was senior class vice president. I thought president would be too much work. <laughs> explains a lot. Um, and, and, but it, was, uh, it, it, it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't that torturous. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't really bullied. I think the, uh, you know, if, if someone screamed, some, if a school bus went by and they screamed something, you know, now if someone says something, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different and aggressive, a little bit more aggressive than, than I think they used to scream out the bus, hey, Gandhi! And I'd be like, okay, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> like, Not bad. <laughs> Not bad. Gandhi's a good guy. Yeah, I'd be like, that's, that's, that's great. But other than that, you know, it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty normal. I know that um, in 2002, this is my... In 2002, it says you were assaulted. Mm. Not to go to that, but certainly at some point, historically, something shifted in the mood of New York. When did you feel that change in the kind of temperament, racial attitudes and such? And sort of I hinted at that earlier when I said instead of Gandhi, it was, it was something else. It was generally Osama. And, um, and uh, so that changed after 9-11. And after 9-11, it was just to touch on that one evening, Four o'clock in the morning at Joe's Pizza after uh, a night at Don Hills. Um, I shouldn't have been out that late. I'm sorry, um, but uh, it was you know. But just some guy sucker punched me in the face. I nearly, oh hey look, we got. I nearly lost vision in my right eye, and we've got a. Uh, ah, uh, that's true. <laughs> we're, we're, we're connecting. I, it's here. coming back. We're, we're, we're like, connecting. We're, we got that eye thing. Right? Um, and it was you know, and, and that's a strange thing because I'm. I, I've been there since I was five and actually have no memory of anything before that. So as far as my conscious memory is, I'm, I'm from New York and there's, there's nothing before that. And so to ha for that to happen in my own city and then for the glares and the anger and the, you know, just the slight, you know, the ignorance and the fear, this fear of the other that, uh, that I had to endure and had to decide which way I was going to fall in terms of how I was going to react. I read that 70% um, of Americans can't identify a Sikh as a Sikh. That it's not, I guess it's not in the popular consciousness of sorts in American. Did you feel, how did that feel for you to just be like suddenly like aware that for example wearing your turban was a, like a, a choice as opposed to just something you would do? do you know, like that it, it, at some point you were like, oh my gosh, I gotta leave the house and I'm gonna have to face this city in a way that was different pre-9-11. Well, I think the, 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 the turban doesn't make me more religious, doesn't make me more spiritual. It's what I do. It's a reminder of, it, you know, of, of what it could mean. And this is exactly when it's for. It's not for when it's quiet and everything's fine. 
this is, what, this is when it's for, is when you are tested, when you are questioned, when, when your community, when other communities are, are, are questioned and pushed and, and bullied, and, and that's when you're supposed to stand up. So we can, yeah, cheers. <laughs> so not too long ago, this year, February 8th, 2016, you were not allowed to board an Aeromexico flight. You're flying from Mexico City to New York, I believe? Yeah, from... For Fashion Week. From Zonamaco to, to yeah, to back to New York poem yeah. for Fashion Week. Um, let's talk through that. How'd that happen? What, what, went, what went down? Well, I, I went to the, to the gate, as one normally does, and long, you know, at, at, at the, at the check-in, they gave me a boarding pass without the SSS, I, I think I said four S's, SSSS, um, and it means secondary screening, and, and so I, I normally get that, and I'm always like, every time I get that, oh, another random search. <laughs> See, this is exciting. I, I can't stay quiet, you know, I'm always, the, the best was after Inside Man, after we had filmed Inside Man, uh, I'd always say to the security, whenever they're doing a secondary search or random search, I was like, oh, I think there's a movie you'd really like, uh, and there's a scene in it that's especially, you, you're gonna really like it. That was a movie I did with uh, Spike Lee, and it was, they'd ripped my turban off, and, and uh, it was, that I was asking, screaming for my civil rights. Um, so they, they didn't let me on the plane. And, and you know, it's, it's slightly happened before where they've said, you know, remove your turban, and I always say no, because I know my rights and where they fall and what, nothing beeped. You know, if something beeped in my turban, I'd, I'd want to know what it was, too, uh, in all honesty. <laughs> Um, uh, but nothing had, thankfully nothing had beeped, and I, so I said, uh, yeah, I mean, I want to be safe too. Um, and so, um, so I was like, so I said no, and then they, they huddled and they came back and said, you're going to have to fly another airline, you won't be flying Aeromexico, and I was just like, I was just confused, you know, and then, and then the, the plane left and I was still standing at the gate, like, with my bag, going, but wait, you, you forgot me. Right. And then... I'm sure word at some point got out that they're like, there's this guy that's in all these Wes Anderson movies, and he's very famous, and you got to get him on the plane. We've got a real PR nightmare here, Aero Mexico, right? Yeah, I think it happened about an hour later where I had a bunch of guys in suits coming to me with boarding passes galore, uh, like, <laughs> like saying, whichever airline I'd like to fly, I, you know, just like <laughs> handing them to me. And, you know, I, I, you know, they... I, I think they realized they, they, they might have, you know, were barking up the wrong tree on this one. And, and it was, I hadn't intended on, I was just going to the airport to go home. You know, I had a great time in Mexico and it wasn't like, this wasn't a time for social change. It was a time to get home and, and see my friends and family. Like it was, it was going home. Um, and at that moment I realized that, you know, so they were like, oh, you know, just whichever one you want to go on. And I realized, I was like, oh, this is one of those points in life where you have to make those decisions, like what you do and, and how, you know, this, this is, and I was alone, I didn't have, you know, I wasn't traveling with friends or anything like that, and, and the, the first interview I did happened to be with the Huffington Post, they were the first ones to break the story, and I remember I was doing the interview behind the bathroom wall, and the, the guys in suits were on the other side. And so every now and then I'd peek over the wall, make sure they were still there, and then I'd go back and do my Huffington Post interview behind. And, and as I was doing that interview, I, I realized I couldn't, that it was too late, I couldn't leave. And that this wasn't about me staying or me getting on the plane and you know, making it more convenient for me, but what happens when the next person could be on the very next flight with a turban or any sort of religious headgear or, or anything that's the other anything that doesn't conform to an accepted norm. And, you know, I've, I've never, you know, be, you know, been the accepted norm. And, and so not even within my own family. And so, so I was like, I, I, I actually can't leave. And, I, and then I said to them, and I said to the press that I won't leave until uh, Aeromexico issues a public apology and they commit to training all their staff in all Mexican airports. Uh, about religious headwear. I think you also uh, made a clip. Is this, we're going to show that uh, Dear America clip. Do you want to give any kind of preface for that? I, so 
when when that happened, I, I I didn't realize how it was going to explode. I was just like, the, but in you know, but across all media uh, around the world, and I'd made we actually shot these originally for the Daily Show. Um, I did an interview on the Daily Show, and and this was, you know, this this idea of of speaking to to America. And as I said to you, like you know, your question about how what was growing up like, it was like growing up like a New Yorker, like an American, like it it wasn't. Uh, it, it wasn't strange. So this was just sort of a, a conversation with, I'd like to have a conversation with the country, you know. Yeah. All right, Ben, let's show that clip. Dear America, I've got some shocking news for you. You should probably sit down for this. Are you ready? I'm an American and proud of it. I was a Boy Scout in elementary school, senior class vice president in high school, and lost my virginity in college. Sorry you have to hear this, Mom. I also happen to be a Sikh, the world's fifth largest religion. The turban on my head represents my commitment to justice and equality. It represents my commitment to humanity. I'm your neighbor. Let's hang out. Maybe we could go get a smoothie. <laughs> Love, Waris. What, <laughs> what is the Republic of Juarez, by the way? We shouldn't discuss that. Okay, it's a secret. Okay, it's Soon fine. to be. You're all invited. Okay. <laughs> um, how did that, you know, what, what was the um, fallout from that? I mean, did you, did you get people writing in saying, thank you so much for doing that? Or did uh, and nonprofits rush at you and be like, can you please represent us now? Or Well, it was surprising. The, I approached it the way, the only way that I knew how and the, the way I've approached everything that I've ever done, and that's with some sort of, instead of being angry at the Aeromexico or where I, I, I approached it with this, this idea of compassion, trying to understand where they were coming from. They, they didn't know it, you know, they weren't educated. So this idea of, of education over ignorance, knowledge over darkness, and, and that was sort of my approach and the way I approach everything in all my work is, is truthfully through, through love. And I was like, that's how I'm going to approach this. And it's, it's okay, you're in Mexico. And I was kind of always in the press being, you made a mistake. I was like, I always make mistakes. You can ask any of my ex-girlfriends. Um, I said that repeatedly in every form of media. Um, that was sort of my apology, my way to apologize. But, um, and, and so, you know, I, it was, that was, I think that's what caught people off guard instead of being angry and like going, you know, the, the, this is like, no, we, we can get through this together. Like, hold my hand and I'll walk you through this. It's, it's, it's kind of easy. We learn and we, and we grow together. It's really effective. Um, I mean, it's funny because we were just talking about journal repay before this, but it, it, there's a certain connection to there in terms of a kind of cultural affinity that people get and it doesn't freak them out and then you walk them along. You are, all, you are also a jewelry designer you have House of Juarez, and you are a man about town in the fashion world. I was going to talk about that for a second because, you know, it's funny. I, I, forever I've lived in a little activist land, which is like scrappy, not always the most fashionable land. Yeah, no offense. For so, I'm sorry. I'm trying. But I was wondering about, like, the, you know, you straddle many spheres. You know, certainly the fashion world, for many activists, feels like a very different universe. It feels very wealthy. It feels very disconnected to the world they know. Well, how do you, you know, how do you navigate that personally? And also, what do you say to activists that feel like that fashion world is completely not their space? Well, I believe in change from within, and so instead of talking to people or talking at people, it's 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 from within and. Uh, I sort of fell into all the things that I do, whether it's film or fashion, and and but the the truest, you know, what what drives me is this the idea of of, of, of humanity, and and that's why I love craft and making things with craftsmen around the world. It's the people that I meet that make those things, and but it's it's really um, 
about change from within. People are more apt to listen when you're, you know, when you're on the same, same level, same page, same, you know, they're like, oh, and they're more open to that conversation. It's about, it's really about creating a space for dialogue. That's, that's all it is. It's removing this fear of the other, right? I've, I've, I felt like I've always, I've always been the, you know, elementary school, I was the only one that was Sikh in high school and college and uh, if, so I've always been the other and, you know, in, over time it, it was just funny, I'd, someone would always, I'd always be stared at and now it's, I'm still getting stared at but I just never know if it's because I'm the other or it's like they've seen a film that I've done or, you know, it's like I just, just yeah, it's just same thing. So I've, I've had this since, since I was a child. Huh. What do you, uh, not to get too deep into it, but certainly the Trump campaign has really like, it's, a, it's an old playbook. You know, I'm sure like many politicians open up, they're like, I'm desperate, let's go with the racist thing. Um, but how does that, you know, how does that affect you? Because it's, it's, it's not just the rise, of, it's not just, you know, xenophobia as a thing, but it's also the disconcerting feeling of, like, I think a lot of us have of how popular or dismissive people are of that. They're like, well, he's, he's you know, that's just, he's speaking locker room talk or something like that. Like this phrase of locker room talk implying that like most Americans are talking like this secretly or with their, with their boards. How do, what do you think of all that? First of all, there's no locker rooms back there. I just want <laughs> everyone to know that. Um, this, this thing of, 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 of it's, it's beyond racism. It, it's it's anti-humanitarian. Right. It's not, it's... <laughs> so this, this, thing of, this thing of race is, is almost, it's, it's beyond that. It's, it's are you pro-human? or against human. That is very true. Um, I want to also switch to this two things. You've got a film you're starring in coming out, directed by um, Harja Singh, called All Quiet on the Home Front. Tell us a bit about that film. It, it's a film about the first Sikh American soldier after World War II, that it was that it was coming back from serving. He was granted citizenship after World War One. Sorry, he was granted citizenship, and and then when he came back from the service, they they revoked it, and they they it was the the Asian Act, and they revoked it not only from him being Indian, but of Indian descent, but they revoked it from the Chinese, the Koreans, the Japanese, everyone and anyone from, uh, and he decided to. He was like, no, actually, I, I studied at Berkeley. I fought for this country. I'm not, I'm not leaving. I'm an American. Like, I, I can't go back to my country. They'll, you know, the, it was, it was a time of the, the British Raj, and he was like, if I go back, they'll, they'll, they'll kill me there, and so I'm going to stay here. And he fought it all the way to the Supreme Court. It's, I didn't really even know about it, um, that much about it. And he, he ended up losing, but then he moved to New York, and from there he met a senator, and and they fought it together and and changed the law so that anyone serving in the U.S. Armed Forces could then become a, a U.S. citizen. And when does that, when does the film, uh, oh. It's a short film, so I don't know where these things go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did the it, internet. It's done. Yeah, the internet. Uh, I like the internet. Okay, let's, Ben, let's show a clip from it. We have to celebrate. Not to mention, women love that mystical Indian thing you got going on. You don't need me to go drinking with you tonight. Yeah, but if I said I did, would you come? Look, I don't know what's going on. I mean, you're staying. We won. Are you sure we won? What is all this? You know what can fix it? Hedonism. It works like a charm. Why do I get an exception and no one else does? How is that justice? Since when does justice have anything to do with the law? I can't accept this in good conscience. Not when thousands of Asian soldiers like me are losing their homes. The law needs to change. There's no other way. Thomas, we have to petition the Supreme Court. Okay, you're tilting at windmills. I'm only here because a state judge granted me an exception. Any other judge could just as easily take that away. We won't be truly free until the law changes. You know this, Thomas. Look, this won't end well, you know. We have to try. What's all this wee business, eh? I can enter a bone in your house from all the legal fees I could charge you. You can have this house. It means I get a home. God. Do you have to be so sentimental all the time? 
I can't help it. Oh, come on then. The law isn't changing itself. We're almost out of time, but I also want to talk to you about your, um, you have a particular cause that you're invested in, which is um, saving the Asian elephants, correct? Can you talk about that? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a conservation organization, and uh, too often I think people look at, you know, conservation organizations or elephant or these kind of charities as, you know, it's saving the animals, what about the people? It, it's a very people, it's, it, it's a very people cause. We lose, we lose, you know, there's two things. We lose, the, we lose the elephant, we lose the rhino, we lose these large mammals, uh, we lose that land then, right? That when we lose those ecosystems and that's, that's the, beginning of the, the beginning of the end uh, for us. You know, when we, lose, uh, when we lose the flora and the fauna that, that support our existence, our, our very existence on this planet. Um, and the, the, other, the other simple reason was the idea that that these magnificent creatures could go extinct in our lifetime is absolutely absurd. I didn't want to look into the eyes of my children that I don't have yet, but um, but and say to them that and point to books and go that these existed at one point and I did nothing to to save to save them. It just it was that simple. I hear that. Um, yeah. It's pretty profound when you think about the rate of extinction. We had Maya Lin uh, present on her project, which she's doing this memorial to all the things that are going extinct, and it's, it's terrifying to think about. Um, I wanted to circle back to this special day in October. I haven't forgotten. Is it October 19th? So um, this October 19th, get ready to celebrate if you're in New York. And why is that, Juarez? It's, it's a, I got an email from the mayor's office and it's a strange, you know, I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. Like I'm, I got an email from the mayor's office uh, asking if I was gonna be in New York and uh, available to come to Gracie Mansion on October 19th as the mayor of New York City would like to uh, make a proclamation of that day being uh, Waris Alawalia Day. Um, <laughs> just in. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I think it's a phenomenal idea. And you're certainly the most New Yorker, New Yorker I know. So, hey, thanks for being with me, Juarez. Thank you for having I'm me. I'm going to be having a lot of fun on Juarez Day. And I hope you are too. Appreciate you being here. Thank you.